Let's pray, and then we'll dive in and uh, follow the Spirit's leading this morning. Father, we thank you so much. You're so good. And uh, Lord, I'm remembering uh, a phrase that you're good, and if it isn't good, that means it isn't done. You're so good, and we declare that you're faithful and true in every way. And Jesus, we love you with all our hearts. Anoint us to hear your word today, to respond, Lord Jesus, and see your kingdom advance in your mighty name. Amen. Well, we're starting a new series called Greater. And we're going to look at several ways that we're called to walk greater. I'm convinced that uh, the church family, the church, the kingdom of heaven is on the cusp of the greater things that was promised to us by God. I'm convinced. The reason I'm convinced, uh, because the promise in Isaiah is that darkness would cover the earth. Great darkness would cover the earth. But the earth will see your light and run to it. Mm. Mm -mm. Half of you are excited about that. Thank you. So, this is really inspired from John 14, 12 to 14, where Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. That's a profound statement. It doesn't make sense that he would say, you're going to do greater things because I'm leaving. But it's because he sent Holy Spirit in his absence, to fill us with the fullness of God himself, that we could walk in the very same anointing and experience even a greater measure than what the disciples saw while they walked with Jesus. So ask, whatever you, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So over the course of this next little while, we're going to be looking at various elements of our walk with God as a family from the, through the lens of greater. Why? Well, because what the, uh, the enemy wants to diminish us. The enemy wants to destroy us. He wants to discourage us. He wants us depressed. He wants us disillusioned. I'm running out of D words. But, but disinfected? No. I, I, oh, oh, disaffected. Oh, okay. Yeah, disinfected didn't work for me, Jack. I was trying to figure it out. In this day, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But my point, team, is this. In this moment, the enemy wants to try to diminish us, and I believe that it's time that we rise up. We engage the greater. We engage that he is greater, that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Friends, this is our opportunity. I said last week that I believe that that we're, I danced a little bit, and, and I repent for that. But what we talked about the God of second chances, and that I believe we're being given a second chance to engage. Now, I'm going to give you some homework this week. I've had a few messages where I've said, you know, you're saying amen at the beginning. You probably won't say amen as much because you're going to get mad at me. But this week, I'm just going to start off by telling you, I'm going to give you a little homework, uh, some stuff you need to dig in and do, and it'll help if you're part of a home group. So I think this will help a little bit. But greater, greater, greater. Of an extent, amount, or intensity considerably above normal or average. It's time that we were no longer normal. It's time that we were no longer average. The ability, quality, or eminence considerably above normal or average. I'm remembering when the first church was, was riding into its importance in society, and the Bible says that that. Everybody respected them. They were scared to join them because of the cost, but everybody respected them. Even in the midst of that ancient pagan culture where persecution was the norm, they were respected amongst the community, even though the people were afraid to join them because of the price they were willing to pay. Greater. Turn to your neighbor and say, greater. greater. Okay, that's terrible. Do it like you mean it's greater. Greater. Greater things. Greater things. So today I want to talk about the fact that we're greater together. 
We're going to be looking at three primary scriptures, and they're going to be lengthy. And so I want you to understand, if you have your Bibles here, you're going to need to pull them out. If you have it on your phone, that's fine. Can I just, can I just for a moment, though, take a, a minute to um, uh, uh, make a case for the value of the actual book? Um, um, I remember a few years back, actually, I went on a sabbatical, and, 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 and before I went on the sabbatical, I actually purchased this Bible. My next sabbatical, I'll be getting a, a new one. And I purchased this Bible, and in the beginning of it, I wrote down what the Lord told me to, to do. This is, is land endorsed February 2014 by a call from the Father to start a new relationship with the book. Because what had happened was I'd been using electronic elements for my, my study, for my devotions and things like that, that I had lost my, my touch to the book. And the things that I was underlining and the notes that I would generally make, you know, were all, they were, they were, uh, 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 they were virtual. And, and because they were virtual, I didn't, have a, I didn't have a relationship with what I wrote down. And, and so it was good to, to just get back in and make notes and, and go through old Bibles. I did, what I do regularly is I take old Bibles um, and, I, and I go through them. When I have a new Bible, I, I, I go page by page to match everything I underlined, everything I wrote, and I put it in the new Bible just to remind myself the relationship that I have with the book and the different scriptures that had impacted me in the past. And I'm startled by how they impact me again in the present. But let me start this off by saying, if you were given a letter, if, if somebody just gave you a letter and you read it and it said this, I am so excited. Never before have I felt so much hope for the world. It's like a blanket of hatred has been lifted and we can see the light and it really isn't a train. Can you believe what lies ahead? Can you sense it? Can you feel it? I can almost taste the wonder and joy. I've never been more hopeful or excited. We are in for our very best days. If you were given that letter and you read it, you'd think to yourself, what are, what are you, high? Like, are you not hearing what's going on today? Right? Or what if you received a letter like this, and it said this? Fear. It's palpable. It hovers over us like the smoke. What's next? Could this be the end? Foreboding, unrelenting, unyielding fear. This changes everything. You'd go, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. However, if I told you that the first letter was written the week after the Second World War ended, does that letter now make sense? Or if I told you that the second letter, which I gave you a hint on, but the second letter was written on 9-12, the day after the towers fell, would it make more sense? Of course it would. And the reason for that is that context is everything. Context is everything. And it's the same way with Scripture. The New Testament epistles were written to specific churches at specific times for specific purposes. And it's important that we have that in mind. Paul, for example, desired that some of his letters would be distributed further than one church, and he shares that on occasion, but he's still dealing with, this, with specific items to the various churches that he's writing to or to the people that he's writing to. That helps us have the Bible speak to us today. Let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul starts by saying, if I can speak with the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Contextually, Corinth was a city of a lot of metalworking. Copper and brass were part of the trade. It was a massive part of their trade. And so if you happen to go down the marketplace and walk through the marketplace, what you would have been accosted with would be the clanging sound of hammer to metal. Bang, bang, bang. This clanging, this, 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 this din that made everything else indistinguishable because of that sound. See, so there's the Corinthians. That made a lot of sense because they were down in the market. And boy, if I could speak in the tongue of men and angels, but if I don't have love, I'm going to be as indistinguishable as that sound when I walk down the road. Interesting, huh? 
The resources exist today for us to pull these things out in case you're wondering. Now, like, I mean, if Paul had written that to a ranching community, he might have said, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels but have not love, I'm going to sound like a herd of sheep. And they'd have gone, oh. And today we'd have gone, oh, that makes sense. Because it makes sense, but contextually there's a greater element of understanding that comes to us. We engage this. What are you going, where are you going with this? Somewhere. Trust me. Hang on. So we understand, however, also that the Bible is a living document. And it's God's prerogative to speak to us outside of its context into ours personally. And, he's, and he does that. I've told you stories about how, how there was a time that I was in a, in a season where God didn't allow me to prepare to speak. And I said, God, I just want to prepare for this one message. It's going to be in front of a, a larger group, and I just don't want to mess up. Can I prepare? And he said, yes, go ahead and prepare. And so, and so I said, great. I grabbed my scribble. I grabbed my Bible. I sit down. I said, what do you want me to say? Now, remember, I'm in a process. He's got me in a process where he's making me by faith speak. He's not giving me the opportunity to prepare. I'm coming up on stage, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, what am I going to say? And he would give me a scripture, and I'd read that scripture out loud for the first time often in the context of preaching and then God would give me a message out of the midst of that and I have scribbler notes where people wrote down the notes for me so that I'd be able to preach the message again later uh, you know that's what God was doing in that time so that's the process I was in but God says yeah go ahead prepare and as I sit down to prepare I say where do I look he says Matthew 10 I open up my Bible to Matthew 10 and the first thing that I see that's underlined is and in that moment when you speak before princes and kings don't be afraid for the Holy Spirit will give you the words that you're supposed to speak so God in his grace, it's his prerogative to speak outside of the context of the word into our context. And often we've had that. The decision I made to leave Gospel Chapel to go to Medicine Hat was done out of Acts, I think it's 6 or Acts 8. I can't remember exact address right now. Where I was like, God, give me something to just help me understand. I open it up and, and he says, and the Lord said to Philip, go south on this road. And I knew that that south meant to go down to Medicine Hat. And the Lord spoke to me. That's, that's how he does that. He can do that. However, the highest point of the anointing of the Bible is to its first audience. It's to its first listeners. It's to the people that were being written to, that were being discussed first. And therefore, its most potent message is found in its context. So, see, so people will say, well, the Bible can say anything you want it to say. Hogwash. Context protects the Bible from saying whatever you want it to say. That's why it's your responsibility to be a good historian contextually and discover the things that are happening around what's being said so we don't abuse the word to say what we want it to say outside of what it's already said. So I'm not saying that we can't open the Bible and say, Holy Spirit, speak to me today. I think that would be really smart. But because of modern biblical illiteracy, we've now become modern biblically relevant. In other words, we create biblical relevancy for the truth that we want declared from the word rather than hearing what the truth of the word has already declared. Make sense? It's an important book, by the way. Like, for us who believe, this is the most important document on the planet. It's more important than the Constitution. It's more important than the Bill of Rights. It's the guiding document of the believer. All the more reason to be fluent in moving it forward. See, because we've made truth relative, well, that might be good for you, but it's not good for me. We've moved forward even making the Bible relative by taking things out of their context and creating a context biblically for our relevancy of truth. Those were a lot of $5 words there. I hope they made sense. Does that make sense? This is an important book that we walk with integrity in. And then what, what's tragic, and if you look on anti-social media, that's what I've decided to call it from now on. If you look at anti-social media, what's tragic is that then this thing, which, was, which, which we are given as a sword, 
is used against one another instead of against the enemy that it was intended for. It's dangerous. Now, writers like Paul uh, will hint towards the purposes of their writing. Furthermore, can I just can I just say something to a lot of times we have there's there's been some talk about unhitching ourselves from the Old Testament. I think Paul and there are some other scholars. I'm not a scholar, but there are some other smart people in the room right now. But I think you would agree with me that Paul likely would have been perhaps alarmed that his letters were considered scripture. I think if Paul were to, to, you know, if Paul were able to speak up when when the Bible was brought into it, made into canon, when we decided that these are the sacred words, I think Paul would have been alarmed by that because actually he considered the Old Testament scripture that wasn't meant to be added to. I'm just saying. So that speaks to the high point of the importance of the Old Testament, and for us to get contextually aware. Paul thought that the law was good. It's just that it was misappropriated by the Jewish people and made into something it was never intended to be. That's just an aside. So, greater together. So if you have your Bibles, I'll, I'll, I'll accept iPhones. I'll accept Galaxies, iPads, whatever. But if you have a book, I'd encourage you, if you're at home, go grab the book. And turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Or, sorry, 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. Greater together. I'm going to actually read the whole chapter and give some thoughts in the middle of it. This is going to be a little bit more exegetical today. That means breaking down of Scripture. Uh, um, and if that offends you that I don't have three points in a joke, uh, in a joke go ahead and be, be offended. I like the book more than I like three points. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Are you there yet? If you, if you have, if, please, you look at a Bible right now. So don't just stare at me. I purposefully, aren't put, I'm not putting things on the screen. All right, here we go. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our, brothers, and our brother Sosthenes. I couldn't say it. To the church of God that's in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that's given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. Interesting, the connection that's to 1 Corinthians 13 right there. But And even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed amongst you, so that you are not lacking any gift as you're waiting for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pause there for a moment. God, Paul is greeting and encouraging that, that he sees the gifts of the, the Spirit amongst them, that they lack nothing. And it's profound because he's going to be discussing the gifts of the Spirit a little later on. But he's, he's saying to them, you, you don't lack any of the gifts. This is profound. And he's going to counsel them on the stewardship of the gifts because they've gone off course. But he has something else on his mind related to that. But it's found here in the next little bit. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no division amongst you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it's been reported to me by Chloe, by Chloe's people, sorry, that there is quarreling amongst you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the, name of, in the name of Paul? I love the housework he does here. I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say that you were baptized in my name. Well, I did baptize the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't know whether or not I baptized anybody else. <laughs> for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom. He's referring to Apollos there, by the way. 
lest the cross become lest the cross of Christ become emptied of the power of its power. So, what's the purpose of this letter? Audience participation time. What's the purpose of the letter? Why is he writing to the Corinthians? Yeah, there's division amongst them. What's the division? I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. Apollos is an amazing person. He, he was a gifted, gifted orator and speaker. He was likely trained in rhetoric, which was an important part of, 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 of status in the day. And, and when he came to Christ, what they did was they shaped his doctrine a little bit because he was such a compelling speaker. They, they helped shape, it, shape his doctrine and then they sent him out. And he must have spoken at the Corinthian church because now people are saying, well, I was of Paul, but now I'm of Apollos. He's a way better speaker. Others are saying, I'm with Peter. What Peter says goes. And then some other ones are saying, well, I'm with Jesus. <laughs> They're fractured. Now, if you read the rest of this book through that lens of their division, you will learn what Paul was saying about the various issues. See, we contextualize it. We think of it through our thing, but we're not thinking it through Paul's purpose to the Corinthian church. Are you following what I'm saying here? This is really, really important for your personal Bible study. I'm equipping you while also hopefully challenging us. Verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Are you Now think of this through the lens of what he's just said. He's just said to the Corinthians, you guys are divided and you're, you're thinking that so-and-so is more wise than somebody else. And he's saying right here, God's wisdom is above them all. Where's the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater with this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through wisdom, it pleased God that through, sorry, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greek demand, Greeks demand wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So he's challenging now men's wisdom versus God's wisdom. He's in that challenge saying to them, you're leaning into the wisdom of men. A little later on, he says something profound in chapter 3, when he says, when you do this, when there's these divisions amongst you, when you say you're of Paul and you're of Apollos, you're, just, you're acting human, merely human. And you were made for more than that. A little later on, we'll see in another, in another book where, where he says that, that for any man who is in Christ is a new creation, old things are passed away and behold, all things are made new. He says, when we, when we fall into these quarrels, we're acting like humans. And we're not. We're new creations. Verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Can you see the application here today? So the most powerful, the most potent understanding of, of this scripture is found in realizing that Paul is addressing division in the Corinthian church. But can you see it right here? Well, I follow Bill Johnson. What Randy Clark says is gospel. What Landon says, I follow him. Well, I follow Jesus. I'm sorry, I've heard that all over the place. I've seen it on anti-social media. I see it everywhere I go. Who I follow. 
and making these declarations. And it's happening even more so because we're looking for wisdom in the present when we're told right here that wisdom is from God. And as a result of searching for who we're going to hitch our wagons to, we're fracturing the body. This thought came to me earlier, and I'll submit it to you. It's not quite as cooked as I would like it to be, but it seems to me that idealism tends to be the first weapon of division amongst people. Let's look at the last election. The idealism between conservatives with you know, some holding a, a far more social perspective, the, the present leader moving it to a bit more centrist perspective, whatever your mindset is of it is irrelevant. What, I, what, what I'm pointing to is the fact that the idealism of either side is what separated people who should be united around conservatism. Liberalism experiences the same thing. If you look at the divide between the liberals and, say, the NDP, that there's an idealism there that divides that, that liberal thought into idealistic factions. And in the same way, I think that as believers, we come into our own personal perspective of what the ideal situation should or would look like, and as a result, we're prepared to separate ourselves from other people as they don't share the same idealistic perspective that we do. Does that make any sense? So, Paul is contending throughout this whole book for unity. Throughout this whole letter to the Corinthians. Are you, are you with me? Don't fall asleep here. Because this is, what I'm giving you in understanding the contextual elements of this uh, scripture should unlock scripture for you. If you just do a little research and find out what the situation was that he's, that he's working around. And why they're writing what they're writing, that'll help you discover the most powerful perspective of what the word is saying in that moment. And it will be magnificently and profoundly, supernaturally applicable to your present day. And instead of being able to shape the Bible to fit into your context so that your behavior can be acceptable, you will be called by the word to shape your behavior into its context. And there's incredible power in that for the believer because you'll find the freedom that's offered in the word. Not the folly that gets presented on occasion by people who want their ideal to be the general ideal instead of learning from the wisdom of God. Chapter 2, Paul goes on to define the wisdom of God. Chapter 3, Paul comes back to this element of factious living within the church. But I'd like to look, I'd like to take another just another look at unity in a, in a different scripture from John 17. Do you have your Bibles? Turn to John 17. I'm going to read this chapter as well. Um, again, if you're, if you're saying, Pastor Landon, this is just too much of the word. You're in the wrong religion. Last week I shared with you out of John 14 through 16 how Jesus, you know, he's had the Passover meal. He's washed their feet. He's walking with them. He, and he said, come, let us go from here. And he's walking along and he shares that. Remember, I said, I am the vine. You, you know, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Every branch, me that doesn't bear fruit, it gets cut away, thrown on thrown the fire. We, we read that. That's John 15. He's headed toward Gethsemane. What's unique about the book of John in comparison to the other Gospels is that John is written from a heavenly perspective where the other three are written kind of like they're they're referred to as the synoptic, synoptic Gospels, a synopsis of the story of Jesus where John moves away from that and he tells the story of Jesus but entirely from the perspective of him being the son of the living God. And so what's shared in Gethsemane about Jesus wrestling through the will of God in the other Gospels is shared from a different perspective of our Savior praying for us before he goes to the cross. And this is what he prays. He lifted his eyes to heaven, John 1, 17, 1, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you've given him the authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this eternal life that they know you. This is eternal life that they know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Oh, oh, would that be an amazing thing for you to say in your final breaths? 
I glorified you on earth, having done everything that you gave me to do. Does that not challenge you to the core? And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had before that I had with you before the world existed. I've manifested your name to the people who you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. Not praying for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and, all, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. In this, in this portion, Jesus is discussing the power of his glory and his future and his coming glory and his return to it. And then he says this, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you've given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And this little portion, oneness with each other, is, equ is equated to the oneness of the Trinity. It's powerful. Our unity is a reflection of the unity of the Trinity. When the world sees our unity, they see what God looks like. That's what this says. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you've given me, and I've guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas there. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. Remember what Paul says about being merely human? Jesus is declaring it right there. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Can I just make a point here? End times theology that looks for an escape is counter biblical, according to what Jesus said right there. I'm not asking that you rescue them out. I'm asking that you keep them from the evil one. It's okay to look for our redemption that's coming, but it's not okay to be escapist and hoping that Jesus hurries up because it'll be better if we're gone. Jesus is like, it's actually better if you're here. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Jesus is about to complete his commission and will commission us in the same fashion that he was sent with the same protection, joy, truth, sanctification, and challenges that he faced. Listen to this. This is where Jesus has a leg up on Paul. Because Paul probably wasn't able to see beyond the Corinthian church that he was speaking to and perhaps the odd church around them that maybe needed that same admonition to how to walk together. Jesus says this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Here we are. He's praying for us right now. That's his prerogative to look a little ahead, further ahead than perhaps the other writers could. That they all, listen, that they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me. And love them even as you love me. Now hold the phone. This is, this, is a, this is profound. In fact, this particular prayer kind of rises to this apex right in the middle. Because Jesus is going to talk about the commissioning and talk about glory in just a second, just like he did in the early part. But right in the middle, the most important part, Jesus prays for our unity more than he prays for anything else in this high priestly prayer. I count four times that he says that they would be one like we're one. 
We have a responsibility to unity. If I may submit it to you this morning in this fashion, we have, before anything, we have a responsibility to unity. I'll show you how to do it in just a moment, but before anything, we have a responsibility to unity. Now look me in the eyes, just for a moment. Friends at home, we have a responsibility to unity. Our first pivot is towards unity. Walking with one another. Loving one another. Championing one another. Not allowing the latest news article, not allowing the latest perspective of vax, anti-vax, not mask, anti-mask, COVID fake, COVID real. None of that. This is such a test of the church to move away from her ideals and come into the full measure of the wisdom of God. There's never been a time, thank you, there's never been a time where it's more important for us to lay down ideals and to pick up the wisdom of God. Why? Because we are greater together. We are greater together. You can hold whatever opinion you want. This isn't to say you're not allowed to have a thought on the subject, but that thought ends at your brain. From there, Lord, give me the wisdom of heaven in relating to the people around me and loving the people around me, regardless of what I think about it. That means something that somebody who's anti-something can love and fellowship with somebody who isn't anti-something without any issues, without any discussion causing strife, without any discussion causing confusion, but rather we're able to just lean into one another in love and, and, and major on the major things that Jesus has come. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, I gave to you what I received as of most important importance that Jesus died and he rose again for our sins as the scripture says we are united around the cross we are united around the resurrection we are united around the infilling of the Holy Spirit that gives us power to walk in the anointing that Jesus walked in so that we could do greater works and be greater together Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, verse 24, whom you have given me, that they may be where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundations of the world. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world doesn't know you, I know you. And these things, and these know that you have sent me and I made known to them your name and will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Again, he's talking about future glory. And that in love, love is the pathway for us to be greater together. Jesus' concern was our unity. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, they were struggling with unity over doctrine, over the gifts of the Spirit, over marriage, over idolatry, over lawsuits, over, over, over orderly services, over food offered to idols. They were even, un, they were even uh, divided over how to do communion. And so he writes this letter saying, I'm concerned. It alarms me that you've allowed these factions to happen amongst you. It alarms me as a leader that we allow factions amongst us. I'm not saying don't have an opinion. Have an opinion. But to remember the calling by which you were called, that Paul said. You're called to walk in family because we're greater together. And there's no more important time than we lay down our ideals. Now is the time to lay down our ideals and pick up the wisdom of heaven. Now is the time. Now is the time to lean into the wonder of this book. To lean into the wonder of the Spirit. To lean into the depth of relationship and identity that we have because we're adopted sons and daughters. And look for what makes us united as family and not for what could divide us on, a, on the basis of opinion. But it's scientific. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. I will stand against anybody who uses this as a weapon to wound any one of you. And this is the most sacred document we have. Everything else is secondary in my mind. 
So you may say, well, science says this. Well, guess what? On the other side, science says that. Don't worry about it. It's a device of the enemy to divide, to cause our witness to the world to be, to be tarnished and to rob us of looking like the triune God that we serve and bring confusion to the world as to who he really is. So how do we walk this up? Well, we're called, we're we're, we're admonished, the Corinthians are admonished in, in turn ourselves to guard the unity of the Spirit through the bonds of love, peace. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. Go back, flip back over to 1 Corinthians 13. The apex of the letter Paul gives to Corinth gives the solution for this disunity that can easily be applied today. If I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I'm as loud and indiscernible as the marketplace you walk past every day. I'm like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It becomes an indiscernible noise. Let me ask you this. Are we starting to hear indiscernible messages? Even the Even the protocols given to us by the government for managing these moments and gathering together are confusing. They're indiscernible. They cover themselves. They don't speak truth. Everything is indiscernible right now. Tells me it's not being shared in love. I'm just going to say. If it can't be discerned, it's likely not shared in love. If I have prophetic powers, see, he's referring back to the stuff he spoke about in chapters 12, and he's going to speak about again in chapter 14. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Boy, let me tell you what, you can open this book and you can have some knowledge and you can have faith-filled stuff and you can say all kinds of profound and powerful things, but if it isn't in love, it means nothing. It's meaningless. It's a misuse and abuse of these sacred words. By the way, I don't look at Facebook after I preach, in case you're wondering if I wonder what anybody says. If I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. You be as generous as you want. If it isn't birthed in love, it shows the agenda. And it's going to be worthless to God. Activity without love is meaningless. And then he goes on to define it. Here's what love is. Love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. Dare I say, it lays down its ideals. It doesn't rejoice. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. Boy, walk outside a little bit and see people get irritated real fast, huh? Temper tantrums. Two-year-old temper tantrums. You've seen it, haven't you? Don't you tell me to wear a mask. Don't you tell me to do that. I don't have to show you that. Believers who are in love with Jesus don't have temper tantrums. We're not irritable. We're not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. He gives an active definition, a working definition of love. This is what love looks like. And it, and it's given to us in the context of overcoming division. If we want to see unity in the body, if we want to see unity amongst ourselves, this is how we do it. We walk in verses four to eight. That's how we walk with each other. You're allowed to think what you want to think. You're not allowed to allow what you think to bring division, confusion, fear. Fear is a terrible motivator. We want to motivate out of love. Then he says this, as for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it'll pass away. 
So he's saying all these things that they're operating in and having to bring some order to, they're good and continue to do it. I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 12, uh, you know, 11, 12. Uh, like they're good. All these things are good, but they're going to pass away. That doesn't mean we stop but we recognize they're going to pass away. Why? Because we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. All of our gifts are partial partial in their expression and their effectiveness. But when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, the partial things will pass away. He says this, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. We, we, we need not to reason in an I'm right fashion like children do. We put those things away. We, we mature in our love. For we see now in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. He's referring to the return of Jesus. So he's not saying that, that the gifts will stop or that we should stop them. He's saying they're only going to be partial until he comes back. Keep going. But when he comes back, we see him. Then we'll know it all fully. So now then, faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. See, the two, there's, there's two elements. The first is the immediate. We only see him part. We, 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 but we will see fully when he's here. But when Jesus' prayer is fulfilled and we're with him, faith will no longer be an issue because we won't have to try to believe. We'll see to believe. Hope will no longer be necessary because our hope will be fulfilled because we're with him. But what will remain is love. That's what will remain. Love will remain. We're greater together. There is so much opportunity to be like the Corinthians in this day and be divided. Like never like never before. In my living history. But here's your homework. Read through the book of Corinthians through the lens by which it was written. Home groups. Have a quick read through the book of of Corinthians. Sacrifice the hour of scrolling through anti-social media and spend an hour reading Corinthians through the lens of Paul solving division. And see if you find yourself there. See if you find the Holy Spirit saying to you something important for today that he said several thousand years ago. And then the second, if I can be so bold, secondly, maybe consider your responses to brothers and sisters today. Jesus wasn't praying for the world. He was praying for the church. And I'm not speaking about the world. I'm speaking about the church. But just really ask yourself the question. Measure your behavior. Measure your connections. Measure your words. Measure your posts through the active definition of love. And if it doesn't fit into that box then you have to really, really, really make a decision as whether or not it should be done. Really. Because the working definition helps us overcome division. And God doesn't want to bring the lost into a divided house. Think of it this way. If you, if, if, if you were an adoption agency and a couple came to you applying to adopt a child and you went into their home and they fought, that's all they did. In fact, as you, as you interacted with them, as you listened to them, as you watched them in action, you could tell that they were on the brink of divorce. Would you want to give that child to that home? Would you? No. Is it possible that our division is prohibiting the harvest? 
Is it possible that our division is creating a barrier where God is unwilling to risk the brokenness that could ensue by releasing people that are broken already into his house? I don't have the answer. I'm just asking the question. Is it possible? So the call to repentance today, I think, has been a beautiful call. And, and it's 12-11. We need to wrap this up. Again, I, 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 I want to be clear that, that this church family is a bit of an anomaly now, I, I'd be careful when I say that, that it's putting stuff on a... This church family walks in a unique unity. You're a beautiful bunch. But here's why, I'm, here's why I'm saying this. As a coach, if I had two football players in front of me trying out for my team, and I set them up to run the 40-yard dash, to time them for the 40 yards, that's, a, that's an important speed time amongst football players. And so if I put them at the, at the, at the line, I say, go, and they both run to me, and they, and they come, and, and they come, uh, and they cross the finish line at the exact same speed. Let's call it 4.9 seconds. They run the exact same 4.9 seconds. But I look at one of them, and one of them has perfect form. Then I look at the other one and he has imperfect form. Which one do you think I would want to have on my team? Which one? Perfect form? Who thinks perfect form? Raise your hands. Who thinks imperfect form? Raise your hands. If you've chose imperfect form, you would be correct. Want to know why? Because I can tweak an extra two or three hundredths of a second out of him by perfecting his form. And with you all, it's the same way. You guys run at a world-class pace. But if we just tweak a few things, we're going to get world record pace out of this family. Because that's who you are. And we are better together. And I love you for it. Would you stand with me, my sweet friends? If you're here today and you haven't had the opportunity to choose to follow Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray a prayer after me. And it's just simply a prayer of dedication. But I look across the room and frankly, all of you are very familiar, but I'm just going to give a quick look to, to give that chance. If you're here today and, you, and you've never had the opportunity to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to join the family of God, or perhaps you've been far away and you want to come near again and want to repent and just say, I'm making my once, my, my once and for all decision in front of some people um, that I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to look from this side to this side. You have nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to be afraid of. We all at one point or another, put our hand up and said, yes, yes, me, I, I want Jesus. And, and we do this publicly because this is a public faith. It's not a private faith. We, we have to live this thing out. Not obnoxiously, but we have to live it out publicly, right? And so if you're here today and you'd like to say, I want it, Pastor Lynn, I want to follow Jesus. I'm going to look from this side to this side real quick, and then I'm going to look back. Give me a wave because we want to pray for you. So quickly, I'm looking across. Is there anybody here who'd like to make that decision and say, I want to follow him. Is there anybody? Okay, I'm going to look back one more time. Just make sure I don't miss anybody. All right. You're here today and you're saying, PL, gotta rep- I'm, I just I want to repent. Because uh, this has got to be about love. And I've let division manage to weasel its way in to my thinking. And I've allowed us versus them to come into my thinking in our own camp. And that alarms me. And if, that's, if that's you... I want you to, 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 and you'll notice my hands going up. I want you to lift both hands to heaven. And, and, and as a, as, as, as a uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? As a, as, like saying, that, yeah, this, I, it's, I, I, I accept that I've been doing this. Go ahead, lift them up. Don't be afraid or ashamed all over this place. Mine are up. And just pray this after me out loud. Lord Jesus, I repent. I repent for not loving my family like I should. I repent for thinking my opinion is more important than other people. Father, I ask your forgiveness 
for where I've let facts interrupt truth. And I thank you for your love. I receive your forgiveness, and I choose the way of love in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said a great big amen.